fresh data here. Fresh data. Oh, re fresh data from Keith Hannon. You heard it here first. Hey, guys, it is Tuesday, April 26th. It is 2 o'clock Eastern time, and this is Advancement Live. I am so excited for this episode uh, because we are, again, talking about live video for alumni engagement. And if you're thinking, uh, dude, you just did that topic three months ago. We did, but there's a whole lot that has changed in those three months. So Advancement Live is part of the Higher Ed Live network. We offer viewers direct access to the best and brightest minds in higher education. And of course, three of them are here with me this afternoon. I'll introduce you to them in just a little bit. And these live broadcasts allow viewers to really share knowledge and participate in discussions about things that are going on in our industry. And today's live viewing experience is powered by Maestro, which is the premier marketing tech platform for broadcasters. And all episodes of Advancement Live are free. They're accessible in the video archives at watch.higheredlive.com. And they're also in podcast format on iTunes. Today's episode is made possible by iModules. You can get the latest white paper from iModules to learn about online giving trends in higher education, including 24-hour giving campaigns, crowdfunding, average gift size, and more. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing and communications firm that works with education institutions on branding, strategy, design, and more. And if you are a storyteller, M. Stoner is offering a free webinar tomorrow, that is April 27th. It's on the anatomy of a story. So you can join CEO and co-founder Voltaire Miron in the session that dives into the foundational aspects of a story that engage both imagination and they spark emotion. Voltaire will also explore the ways in which you should use storytelling techniques to reveal and build your brand. Registration is free, and we are tweeting out the link right now. So, without further ado, I want you to meet my three guests for this afternoon's broadcast. We'll go until about 2.50 Eastern Time. We have so much to talk about. And I want you to first meet Dom. Dom is digital and social media specialist at Duke University. He develops social media and website content for the main university accounts on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Google+, and other social networks, as well as for Duke Today and Duke's homepage. And you can follow Duke, uh, follow Duke, of course, but also follow <laughs> Dom. Uh, on Twitter, he is at Dom underscore for short. And, uh, and Dom, I promise, even though there is a bit of a rivalry between Syracuse and Duke, uh, that I will be nothing but nice during today's episode. Will you do the same? <laughs> yeah, I'll try not to take it personal. All right, all right. Hashtag beat Duke. Anyway, so Keith Hannon. Um, Keith is in the chipperest of chipper moods this, uh, this afternoon after coming off a 24 our uh, live video campaign for their giving day at Cornell University. He is Associate Director for Digital Innovation. He manages the Cornell alumni communities on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, and Instagram. That's an aggregate population of about 60,000 alumni. And in his past life, he was an aspiring video artist, which makes him really good at live video, YouTube videos, all that jazz. So. Before Cornell, he was at Nickelodeon, he's been at Six Degrees Games, he is everywhere, and you can follow him on Twitter as at Keith Hannon. Keith, tell us how you're feeling uh, this afternoon after that big broadcast. I'm feeling Jim. great. It's, it's nice to be answering questions and not dishing them out. It's a nice change of pace to be not a host. Awesome. So. I look forward to answering questions from you and not having to do anything well, else. I can ask them. And finally, we have Paige Rollins. Paige is Assistant Director of Live Digital Events, which we will get to that title in just a little bit. She's at Longwood University, and she serves as a primary contact for all office web-based initiatives. She's implemented a live web series for Longwood called The Real World Chronicles. She also creates and records regular alumni updates for Ryan Catherwood, who is someone familiar to our Advancement Live viewers. He used to host this broadcast. And uh, Paige also conducts alumni video interviews. She's charged with devising the content marketing strategy for her office. And you can follow her on Twitter as at Paige Rollins with a little underscore at the end. Someone must have beat you to Paige Rollins, huh, Paige? Yeah, it was a little better, but it's fine. <laughs> Hashtag the struggle is real. 
Awesome. All right. Well, we're going to jump right into it. Uh, Paige, I'll make sure your sound is okay. You sounded a little quiet on that last uh, thing you said, but hopefully we'll be good to go because my first question is for you, and it is to tell us a little bit about that title. When I saw Ryan's email and he said, meet my assistant director of live digital events, um, I have to admit, I was like, seriously, that's her job title? That's awesome. <laughs> so uh, tell us a little bit about, about how that came to be and what exactly you do. Absolutely. So can you hear me okay, first of all? Yes, yes. Awesome. Um, so when you first hear live digital events, I know it sounds somewhat like an oxymoron. Um, and so I'm brand new to the alumni world and to actually really um, the whole higher ed as a whole because I just graduated last May, so almost a year from now. Woo, congrats. Um, thank you. And basically it's the perfect fusion of being able to host a live event. So if we have a speaker on campus, we can also broadcast it out to any alumni all over the world. So Longwood is in Farmville, Virginia, which is a very small town in central Virginia. And um, it's not super easy to get back to all the time. So this way, it's the perfect combination of people being able to engage with Longwood, but just staying right from their computer, too. And there's so many different opportunities to do it, too. And I would imagine as an alumna, it's pretty cool to work for your, your alma mater, huh? It's really cool. I mean, I, I feel like I never left, which is really exciting, too. <laughs> Good. Awesome. Dom, tell us a little bit about, about what you do for, for Duke. Um, and you have experimented a bit with Facebook Live. We've got some tweets that we're going to fire up, some links to some of the work that you've done. Um, what's been your experience so far down at Duke with using some of these newer platforms? Yeah, it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah, we're good. Okay, great, awesome. Uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. So my my role is actually just kind of the day to day management of our accounts. Um, and so prior to this year, prior to uh, Periscope and Facebook Live and all that kind of fun, um, all those kind of fun new toys, um, Google Hangouts was kind of our go to space for live stream stuff. Um, and that's been usually uh, used for things like speaking engagements on campus, um, a lot for admissions and prospective students, and I can talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then so now with, with Periscope, it's been something that we're still kind of figuring out as we go, I'm sure like a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so we've kind of just kind of experimented with all different kinds of things. Um, Facebook Live, again, that's something that we're still kind of uh, dipping our toes into. Uh, but overall, it's just been a lot of fun, and we've had a lot of uh, lessons learned. Well, you got to talk to me about that 10-hour Periscope broadcast that you did. Yeah. I'm lucky I can hold my phone up for like five minutes going like this. So, yeah. so talk to me about 10 hours on Periscope. Yikes. Yeah, and I, so I've got to, before I, before I do, I've got to admit, what it originally came from was, so I was watching uh, this Periscope webinar, and this guy was talking about like, yeah, I, I did this nine-hour Periscope once, and it was just like me sleeping. Like I was literally unconscious for nine hours. And I got th thousands of viewers. <laughs> and I was like, that's really cool. I want to do that at work. <laughs> so I found an excuse to do it. Um, we heard about this reading marathon that was going on on campus. Um, and it's not, not usually you know, social media fodder. Um, but we were asked to cover it in some way. Uh, and so I, I just brought my, my camera and a tripod. And I set up a Periscope broadcast in the back of the room. Um, Left it there, came back 10 hours later, um, and there were 12, uh, 1,200 viewers, which was pretty cool to see. Um, Sorry if you heard that sound. That was me clicking on a video that Keith just sent of something they did down at Cornell. I apologize. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Um, but yeah, I guess overall we just kind of learned um, that if you kind of keep that window open for people to kind of tune in and uh, drop in for a couple uh, seconds, a couple minutes, um, and maybe come back later, the more you can kind of open that window of opportunity for people to tune in, um, they will, they'll do it and they'll show up. That's awesome. Well, speaking of showing up and being on air for a really, really long time, Mr. Keith Hannon coming off 24 hours of being on air live nonstop for Cornell's Giving Day. Keith, tell us about, about this year and any lessons learned from last year that you incorporated this year. Uh, well, I learned that there are positive benefits to having children who don't let you sleep uh, because it trains you well to do crazy things like 
interview people nonstop for 24 straight hours. Uh, I think what we learned last year when we did it was that, uh, one, our actual set was a little bit of a mess. Uh, literally, I had uh, like duct taped things to blinds, uh, like paraphernalia and stuff and swag. And So we, got, we did a little bit better with the set this time, but in terms of the online experience, uh, it's we, we really wanted to offer our audience a more interactive experience besides mm -hmm. just listening and chatting and tweeting. Uh, so uh, I will give Maestro a second plug uh, today and because we used them for, for our Giving Day broadcast, and it was great. Uh, to be able to offer uh, things like polling and to offer... Uh, pop-up links directly to specific giving pages on Giving Day just made it a more interactive and cohesive experience, and that's really what we wanted to do this time around. And we had more guests this time around. We did 50 guests in 24 hours. Uh, so that was a lot of interviewing, a lot of chatting, but uh, I think it's as, as grueling as it can be, it's one of the few times a large university like ours is all broadcast. We're all broadcasting the same message across campus, and to feature all the different areas, all the different disciplines, all the different you know programs and uh, students and faculty, uh, all in a row on the same day, really makes the campus feel a little bit smaller and makes it feel like we actually. Uh, can appreciate everything that we're doing, whereas the other 364 days a year, everyone's a little bit more siloed and doing their own communications and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that was kind of it, it in a nutshell. Nice. Well, you mentioned your set had some improvements for, yeah. for this year. Paige, your set for Real World Chronicles is, uh, is relatively, you know, plain and simple. Tell us about that show and, uh, and how that came to be. What, what, is it, what does it mean? Um, well, it was awesome towards the end. So we had three sets of speakers. We had two people we brought in um, from, they were LinkedIn influencers, and then we had one successful alumni. And we first started out in our big auditorium where we had like freshman orientation, and um, we used a product called Zoom, which was awesome because we could keep track of the registrations and see um, kind of like customize the information we wanted to get back from all the people who were watching. And yeah. that wasn't the problem. The problem was we used a camera that was probably from like the early 90s. And so I went hold, hold, hold the phone. When you emailed me about this, you were referencing how old this camera was. Um, <laughs> okay. Keith, are you with me and wanting to give Paige a good old punch in the face for calling the early 90s old. It's all right. It's all right. That was our childhood there. Uh, but anyway, it was, an early, it was an early 90s camera. Keep it, going. It was. And well, it, was it was wonderful and beautiful and it <laughs> aged really well. And um, every time uh, the speaker would turn one way, the camera would just zoom in and then it would like, widen and then turn black and white. And I also had the stomach flu. Um, so I introduced the speaker. I ran off stage. I actually handed my microphone to Ryan Catherwood, ran to the bathroom, just got really sick, then came right back on, said, all right, we're done, and that was the day. So the first round was really, really tough, um, but we have awesome broadcasting studios and um, all sorts of different activities and places that we can use for um, these kind of events on campus. But the one we found that was the most successful was a webinar room, so we had two different screens. Um, and the ability to have a camera that followed the speaker when we were able to broadcast things out. So they could see the chats that were coming in live from our viewers as mm -hmm. well as they could present something behind them. So it was a so little bit... So how are these events then? Sure. Um, we just did a sequence of three all in one month. So in the month of um, February. Got it. So what else is coming? What's on the horizon for live digital events at Long? Well, it's funny you ask, so I don't know if you've heard, but in the fall we're hosting um, the U.S. Vice Presidential Debate on campus. So that's really exciting as far as the possibilities that we can broadcast out live. We had Reggie Love, who was President Obama's assistant um, all throughout his years on the campaign, and he came to talk to students and athletes and everybody on campus, and we broadcasted that out live. But one thing I'm really looking forward to is at the end of July we'll be hosting a LinkedIn Influencers Week. Um, 
where we'll be doing sort of these kind of hangouts and talking with them, as well as we'll be producing some content specifically for Longwood. So keep an eye out for that, too. And you'll use Google Plus for those? I believe so, yeah. Awesome. Well, speaking of the Hangouts, Dom, you alluded to this earlier, and this is something we're thinking about in our office now, um, virtual Hangout for our admitted students, or a, mm -hmm. we, we call them send-offs when we do it in person, but you've found a way at Duke, it's become an annual tradition to do these Hangouts. Tell us about how that works, and is there any plan to use a different technology this year now that Google Plus has, has evolved to some new guys on the block? Yeah, um, you know, I think, honestly, I think we'll stick with Google Hangouts um, just because it's worked so well for us. And I think as far as kind of having targeted um, specific audiences uh, with, you know, Facebook and Periscope, we're not really sure who's tuning in. It's a pretty broad audience. Uh, with Google Hangouts, uh, the people who are tuning in are there because we sent them the link and they set aside time to to watch it, uh, but so what we do for admitted student, students is we have a, a Q&A session, uh, and we have um, current students speak to, to admitted students, um, and they answer just like a wide variety of questions over, over an hour, um, and, and it's a lot of fun, and we, we have that video archived afterwards uh, in the description section. We have kind of like a table of contents for each um, for each question, so if people want to go back to specific questions about housing, they can do that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think we'll stick with Google Hangouts. Um, also with, uh, so that's for admitted students who are still in the decision process, but for incoming freshmen in the fall, we also have a pretty, I'm not sure if I sent this to you, but it's actually a pretty kind of comprehensive live half hour show. Um, and there's like multiple camera angles and multiple hosts and multiple locations across campus, and it's like kind of this Today Show setup. Oh. Wow. Um, yeah. And that's and it's, all through Google Plus? Yes, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, so I mean, I think we'll stick with Google Hangouts, even in spite of all the uh, cool new uh, kids on the block, like you said. And when does that air, when that new student show? Right when they sure. get to campus? Um, right when they get to campus uh, during move-in week. Uh, and so we actually usually have it on the day when they, after they've moved in, and there's this, like, class photo. I don't know if Syracuse or any of the other schools do that. But, um, yeah, we just have it while they're all there out on the quad. And I can send you that, that link. That's awesome. We'll make, sure to, we'll make sure to tweet it out. Well, Don yeah. alluded to this, Keith, and I'll bring you and, and Paige and Don back in on this. But, Keith, first, the whole beauty in Google Plus is you know who's watching or you know you've sent them the link and you can gather info. With our Facebook videos and with our Periscope videos, you can't gather email addresses and how many times do the higher up say, who got the email addresses for these? So do you think that the coolness of being able to go behind the scenes with something on Facebook Live outweighs the desire to get that information, the who's watching and what their email is? Yeah, you know, I think you always want the people first. Uh, I think you want the engagement. Uh, if you are unable to attract a crowd or an audience, the tools in which to capture people is a little irrelevant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so I think you can find ways to use these different channels that may not have mechanisms for you to track uh viewers uh, in terms of knowing who they are via email address or whatever it is. Uh, but I think there's still ways to push kind of those viewers through a funnel of sorts. Uh, anything that lets you embed the video, you uh, what we do a lot with our live streams is we'll take the embed and we'll put it on one of our own websites and then we can put up a wall on mm -hmm. our own website. So even when a network might not allow you to uh, kind of email protector, uh, force a login, we can do that on the website. Now, to be honest with you, I'm not sure if you can, in, I'm guessing you can't embed Facebook Live right now. Facebook usually likes Facebook to happen on Facebook. Stay in Facebook, yeah. only Facebook, never leave Facebook. Stay. Right, right. They're kind of the, the <laughs> Apple, the Apple of social media in that regard, I suppose. Yeah. But, um, but I do think you can, you know, the nice thing about Facebook Live is you can chat with people and you can 
you know, if somebody's working the camera, somebody else could be working the chat, and you could be seeing who's chatting, you could be posting links, trying to get clicks on those links. So there's ways, I think, to reach out and get kind of more individualized engagement. Uh, but for the most part, you know, as higher ed institutions, I don't think we can be picky. I think we still we still need to be desirable in social media when we're up against all the other content that people are engaging with. You've posted, well, first I'll let Paige weigh in on that and Dom as well. Thought, thoughts on that about gathering information? Does it really matter who's watching so much that they are watching? I definitely, I definitely echo everything you said because it's so easy just to scroll through your feed and see a video already starting to play. And that's, we've tried a couple different things too when posting videos that we've made. So the updates that Ryan and I did, whether we're uploading it directly to Facebook or using linking it to YouTube. Um, but some of the things we've used to capture the information, like I said, was Zoom. But we've also used Brazen, which is an interesting yeah. um, kind of chat tool that you can use as well. And that's also to customize the information that you're getting. But I don't know, as, especially from a newer office and kind of a newer way of thinking for Longwood, um, I think right now we're just looking for people to engage and learn how to use these digital events and actually tune in. And so I, I don't know necessarily how important it is to get their information right now, uh, but once we have those like viewers that are hooked, hopefully, um, then we can get their information. Tom, would you agree to, to what Keith and Paige have said? And thank yeah. you for tweeting me. I'm just retweeting now. Dom just sent the... Uh, class of 2019 photo live stream. So we're sharing that out right now. Thanks, Dom. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, and I guess on getting demographics on people tuning in, um, I, I mean, I so wish that we could. But I, I feel like with any anything we do on social media, there's always that challenge. Um, you know, there's there's kind of, um, it's kind of a risk that we take on any channel. It's And it's kind of a, a leap of faith that we have to take that, if we post content, you know, that specific audiences are, are kind of tuning in. Um, and so we have, a, like, we have a pretty good guess of, of who that may be, but again, it's, it's only an educated guess, and I think we're, we're fine with that. Keith, as you're tracking um, views on Facebook, our higher-ups here at Syracuse are really interested now in Facebook video, like really interested in the stats, and for us it was great. Um, in the not to rub it in, Don, but with two Final Fours, though, <laughs> yeah, we, we've got oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we had some really good engagement on social um, and on Facebook Live videos in particular. The one stat I really like is how many of your viewers watched for, I think, is it longer than 10? Now, of course, I'm blanking as I ask this question, but like, what was your retention rate? How many people watched the entire video start to finish? So as you're looking at the stats around Facebook Live videos, and this would go for you, Dom, I know you've used it, um, what stats are you most jazzed about? Like there's unique viewers, there's total views, there's percent who watch the full way through. What do you, what are you focused on? Well, I think we're focused on unique viewers first. I mean, that's, that's uh, well, you know, I hesitate to say that even. Uh, I mean, it's good to know how many people watched, uh, but it's always tricky because Facebook, I think, really stacks the deck in their favor to be able to tell you that a lot of people watched with their autoplay and everything else, right? So yeah. it's really hard to know whether that view is did somebody actually sit there and watch or were they scrolling their news feed and it started to play. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, in terms of is the content engaging, you have to look at average view duration uh, and know if, you know, it's one thing to, you know, we always talk about it's one thing to have the technology and utilize the technology. It's another thing to actually be interesting for your audience. Right. Um, so it's great to go live. It's great to, to have the tool, but are you actually broadcasting something that's resonating and people find appealing? Uh, so I think whether it's Periscope or Facebook Live or live stream, we, we look at viewer duration. If we can get five minutes of someone's time, I think that's a lot online. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think the next step is, and, and you know, we're, we were trying to do this with uh, Giving Day using the Maestro platform. Uh, if we can get them to take an action in those five minutes, uh, then that would be great. But I think right now, especially in terms of the Facebook Live being really in its infant stages, uh, getting people to tune in and stick with it for five minutes, I think, is a great goal. 
I think with Facebook Live, there's a hesitation. Like when you do it through Cornell, is it literally Keith's iPhone and you're rolling, or do you feel like you need to have the iPad? It needs to be an iPad on a tripod. It, like I feel like people ask me these questions all the time. Oh, you're going to use Facebook Live? Like how's it going to look? Well, that's the beauty of it, in my opinion, that it looks raw and behind the scenes. Yeah. Look, I'm taking you where no one else can go. Um, I'll ask Keith first, and then and then go to to Dom and Paige on that question. You know, these new tools like Periscope and uh, and Facebook Live is the rawness a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, I probably have frustrated some communicators at Cornell and uh, enraged a lot of my video professors from Ithaca College and how my career has advanced in terms of not caring very much at all about production value. Uh, because I think. I think the online audience is the one who sets the terms, and I think we've seen, not just in higher ed, but through all different various forms of online video, that production value is only so meaningful. You want production value, go to Regal Cinemas and watch Star Wars. Uh, but, you know, if you want engagement, and let's be honest, most of us don't have big video budgets, right? So. Uh, it's not even an option, really, to have high production value. So just go with it. You know, use whatever can capture the content. It's the content that matters. It's, it's the students fighting up a hill in the middle of winter. Uh, it's not are they properly lit or is it color corrected. It's capturing that experience. And I don't, you know, I try to tell people don't, don't stymie yourself uh, by fussing over production value, and then you lose the authentic content, which. Like you said, I think uh, the rawness has a way of making it feel real, and I think people come accustomed to you know FaceTiming with family or just sharing videos from their phone. So this is this is a type and a quality of video that we're all accustomed to seeing every day in our real lives, and it's usually the most shareable uh, of the videos and the most viral of the videos. Awesome. Before I go to Dom, uh, I just want to remind folks that if you do have any experiences that you want to share in terms of what your schools have done uh, with live video, or if you have questions for Dom or Paige or Keith, um, please do tweet those using the hashtag Higher Ed Live. Uh, that's how I'll see them, and I can I can ask our awesome episode guests uh, of your questions or, or even just share your experiences. That's how I found Dom three months ago on Live Video Part One. Dom was tweeting on the hashtag, and now three months later, here he is. So you too could be an advancement live star <laughs> if you ask a question today. Uh, but anyway, Dom, what are you, what are your thoughts on the whole production value of this? I imagine with Google Plus um, and that show you do, I can't watch it or else it'll blare a video um, and noise again. But I imagine that that production value um, is a little bit higher than you know some of the stuff you've done on Facebook Live and Periscope. For sure, yeah, and I I agree with Keith. I I think like now that the barrier for entry for all these new live platforms um, have been has been lowered uh, so much that it's kind of changed the whole ecosystem of live streaming and what people expect from from live stream videos. So I think the 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 challenge for us over the next uh, you know, year or so will be kind of making the argument for those live uh, for those kind of raw um, pieces of content that Keith mentioned. I think we'll try to um, do that as much as possible. Awesome. Paige, what do you think on that topic? The one thing that comes to mind is, and however, while this wasn't live, we did our uh, video updates that we do um, like twice, three times a month about what events are coming up and everything. And the first one we did with Ryan, he was sitting at a media desk, he had a tie on, he had like this background behind him, everything was super formal. Um, and we were getting some views, and no offense, Ryan, love you. But um, <laughs> we did just recently, I'm in a t-shirt, I'm in jeans, we have like real awkward jump cuts, and at one point I forget what number I'm on of the like, top <laughs> six things that you should be doing as an alum. Um, and that just, blew up in comparison to other ones we've done. So, I mean, I think people want to see real things, and sometimes if it's too formal, they'll get bored and see something else that they can just see more instantly. I think we come across as being more approachable when it's just that, especially if you're, you know, on camera doing this, it's so much more approachable. I mean, even like we're doing now, we're all hanging in our offices, we you know, have a little product placement behind us, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> where do we work? But really, it's just it's having a conversation, and it's taking people where they can't go. Um, Keith, you had done a, a Facebook Live video for Dragon Day, the one that I accidentally popped up earlier. Um, we can definitely tweet that out for folks to see. Tell me about that. Was that one of your first, or 
Um, why that one to, to share with the audience today? Yeah, I think it was one of our first Facebook Lives, and the reason we chose to do that, so Dragon Day is a 100-plus year tradition at Cornell. It's a parade. Architecture students build this giant dragon and parade it through campus. And for years, we were uh, trying to uh, figure out a way to capture this live, and it just it never, the technology was awful. I think since like 2010, we were trying to do this. And finally, with Facebook uh, Live and live streams, mobile interfaces, uh, the college, the Ecuador, architectural school uh, live stream the actual parade so we didn't have to do that so I was trying to think of a way that we could give a different experience and so I spent you know the half hour leading up to the parade just hanging out with the students as they were putting the finishing touches on the dragon you know students they are occasionally known to procrastinate and, and I was uh, there as they were scrambling to get the dragon finished and kind of interviewing them as they did it. Uh, did they really want some random dude putting a phone in their face as they were scrambling to finish their dragon? Probably not, but they were all pleasant and uh, made for a good experience. And we had people chatting in. One guy said he's he was in he was at Purdue uh, <laughs> at Purdue touring the campus with his kids because they were interested in going to Purdue. But he was watching our live stream as he was doing it. So. Wow. Uh, he was in uh, at Purdue, but his heart was at Cornell. And when you think about then sharing that video, so all those students who they know they were in the video that that guy from the alumni office was shooting, and now they go and find that video, hopefully, on your page, and you get the students then engaging with your alumni page, sharing it with their networks, and I just see so much benefit in that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, anytime you can kind of merge the student experience with the alumni population uh, abroad, I think I think there's a lot of power in that, and that's really what social media is kind of tailor-made to do. Uh, we were talking about, you know, analytics with regards to Facebook Live, and we just recently started in on a partnership with Evertrue's Giving Tree, and uh, I just was looking for confirmation on this, and, and Ashley Bud confirmed that it looks like we do, uh, Giving Tree does pull in analytics, uh, from uh, Facebook Live, and for those of you who don't know, I don't, I'm not trying to do a plug here, but Evertrue, kind of <laughs> <laughs> Giving Tree merges with your backend database. So if you have that and you're using Facebook Live, uh, it's conceivable that the people watching Facebook Live, uh, that's talking with the software and connecting those people to your database. So there is a way to that's that's a way where you could get information on the people that are actually watching in a way that Facebook doesn't upfront really offer to you. Well, Dom, we have a, a question from the Twitter audience. Chris Alexander is ready to be the next Advancement Live superstar. Um, sorry, oh, too much coffee today. Um, Chris <laughs> asks... Um, Send some over. I should, right? Um, <laughs> Chris says, for you, for you, Dom, well, you probably saw it because he mentioned you, but he's wondering, um, what do folks use to switch between video streams when you're doing the Google Hangout? Yeah, and so full disclosure, um, that that last time that we did that um, was my first day on the job here at Duke. Oh. So, <laughs> so as far as the logistics of of how to switch between videos, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to speak to that. Hey, that's no worry. That's why that's why God invented Twitter, and you can follow up with him on Twitter after you find out the answers. It's, right. it's perfect. Hey, yeah. no sweat at all. Oh, what else do I have on this episode of Higher Ed Live today? Let me, I have about 9,000 screens open, so let me find the script Kim, screen. Kim, I can kind of answer that. Yeah? Oh, awesome. Crowdsourcing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that'd be great, Keith. So the, the question was about switching between live broadcasts? Yeah, like with the Google Hangout that they do, um, I assume that Chris was talking about the freshman experience, how if you've got the four cameras going, switching between them all, I think, is the question. Chris, if I'm not asking the right question, please tweet it again. Yeah, all I would say, you know, what we did with our giving day was we just created uh, separate Google Hangout events, and we're just kind of switching between those events. Uh, our home page on the website was just pulling in uh, various links, and so it was just easy to uh, 
kind of have whatever we wanted to show up at the time appear on the on the web page. So basically, queue up a bunch of Hangouts, and then let the let the Maestro platform pull in whichever one you want live at the time. I don't know if that really answers the question, but that's that's how we handled Giving Day. What I've learned is that Maestro is really, really good for doing this. You, you had a really good experience, which is great. I mean, we the, did have a good experience, yeah. And that's what the show is all about, really. You know, through these episodes, showing our viewers what works, like what we've tried, what was a big fail. Don't get the flu when you're about to do your first big real world <laughs> yeah. article. We learned that from Paige. That was a good one for sure. I've um, learned to eat lunch before going on Advancement Live. Uh, after oh, are you hungry? <laughs> I'm sorry. Are we coming from your lunch? <laughs> You have 15 more minutes, and no, then was, will be, so no, hang no, tight no. there, killer. You can do it. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, remember that time when Meerkat came out, and everyone was excited about Meerkat? Have any of you, you used Meerkat, slash why do we think um, Periscope has kind of risen? I mean, obviously, Twitter and Periscope have their partnership, but any experience with that, or, or thinking that that might come back to life at some point? Uh. <laughs> I, I I don't I don't I don't really have a a good answer for that. I mean, for me personally, I had a bad meerkat experience, but I've never <laughs> been assaulted by periscopes. So I would no, I didn't. Uh, meerkats are good. Don't don't be anti meerkat. Uh, I think yeah, I think the Twitter partnership was a big bump. It's just kind of like well, we kind of have to have Twitter, and if it's going to play better with Twitter, then. It, it's kind of a it's kind of a no brainer, and I think that's just uh, and I tried them both, and uh, I guess for me that was kind of the tiebreaker. Tom and Paige, any experience with Meerkat? I feel like Paige, um, more of the the era that would use it came out right as you would have been a senior. No, nothing. No, just it, Periscope, it, it, and like he said, it's the fact that it's so easy and accessible right there with Twitter. That like I don't even think about. No offense, Meerkat, don't think about it. <laughs> No, no, we won't offend anyone. I'm thinking around commencement time, how many of those phones are going to be out in the audience with students live broadcasting their, maybe they don't care about their commencement speakers, I don't know. Um, but just thinking as we go into, you know, arguably one of the busiest times of the year for alumni associations as we're welcoming a whole new crowd uh, of alumni to our alumni families, thinking about how we might use that technology. And it kind of, it leads me, it was going to be my last question, but it's going to be my now question. So. Um, as you start to think about planning for next year and, and, and what are those events that are really going to be important to share with your alumni audiences or with audiences in general, Dom, I know you don't just do the alumni accounts, uh, you know, what are those top three events that you would ensure are part of your live video engagement strategy for alumni? Um, so for us, uh, so on our uh, so talking strictly Facebook Live, uh, Facebook, we have such a broad audience, and a large uh, segment of them are basketball fans. Uh, so if I could pick, uh, if I could pick things uh, to broadcast live, they would be mostly basketball. Um, our Midnight Madness event, uh, I think, would be awesome if we could kind of get some kind of behind-the-scenes footage. Uh, there's kind of this bubble around athletics. Uh, and they kind of protect what we can and can't uh, live stream, but it would be nice to kind of get the student perspective, and I imagine alumni would be really excited to um, to kind of relive things that they did while they were at, at Duke. Um, so if I could do that. Um, also, we have so we have uh, Chesheskyville. Uh, it's where students uh, camp out for up to a month before uh, the big game against UNC. We have uh, Bayheimberg. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, and so it's uh, this kind of big thing. It's uh, as an outsider, I think it's pretty weird. But so, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it would be cool to just kind of uh, get raw uh, behind the scenes stuff that that we all mentioned. Awesome, Keith. What are you thinking for Cornell? Uh, so definitely reunion is a is something. Uh, reunion weekend we we do anywhere from six. We've done eight or nine over the course of the weekend. Uh, events live streamed, uh, and we've and that's also through, mostly through livestream.com, like the the yes, main yes, yeah. we we and then uh, smaller scale, we've used Google Hangouts to assist classes, especially the older classes, do a virtual reunion. Uh, so we had like a, a, a woman join her class dinner via Google Hangout, and she was, I think. 
somewhere in her 90s. Uh, so it was like a it's like a 75th or 70th class reunion, and so we were able to bring her into her uh, her class her big class dinner remotely via Google Hangout. So it can work on a on a large scale with just you know beaming out these events to all alumni and then helping connect classmates uh, is another way that, that we've used it. And in the past, we see it usually uh, adds another 20 to 25 percent uh, in terms of a reunion attendance. So you take you take everyone there and then you add another, you know, thousand plus people uniques uh, coming in from the live stream and you've, you've kind of added to your to your reunion attendance. And See, this is a bit of a battle we have here because they say, well, if we live stream it, they're not going to come. Mm. If we tell them that there's going to be a live stream, then they're not going to come to homecoming. Um, did you face that at all when you started live streaming uh, your reunion or homecoming events? You know, I think when we made it clear we were going to invest heavily in, in live stream opportunities, there was a little bit of that. People were a little bit scared that live stream would, would cannibalize in-person attendance, but look, when it comes to reunion, I mean, are you going to say, oh, no, I don't want to go listen to rock music in the beer tents with my friends. I'm just going to sit home and watch the lecture. <laughs> you know, I mean, let's be honest, like, that's not reunion. You know, that's, right. that's what we're doing is we're showing little pieces of reunion, uh, some for the people that, that couldn't get back, but if, if they're not at reunion, but they want to be at reunion, uh, it's probably because they had some conflict. It's not because they're choosing the live stream over the actual reunion experience. Like, you can't walk around and tour the gorges uh, through live stream. <laughs> so the idea that the campus experience is somehow uh, not as exciting as a live stream broadcast, I think, is a little ridiculous, to be honest with you. Uh, but it does provide some nice marketing for people that are, you know, a year out from their reunion to kind of see some of the neat events that are going on. And now with Facebook Live and Periscope, we can do a little bit more person on the street perspectives uh, where we can just kind of go live in an instant if something interesting is happening. I did a little video a few years ago because somebody proposed on campus during reunion, so I caught up with those wow. people. And so Aww. stuff like that, um, you know, that you can kind of cap try to capture in real time. Uh, so if anybody from Cornell's listening and you're going to propose at this year's reunion, <laughs> give me a heads up so I can periscope it. I'd love to, love to capture that live. And then if you could do it again so then I could do it on Facebook Live, that would be great. Right. Get even more engagement. Well, Kim, I'll just bring a second. Next time doing on Facebook okay. Live, she'll say yes, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, having, being confident of the yes answer would be a real key part of that equation. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we're it's sad. Sad TV. That would be that would be very key. Paige, what are you thinking about at Longwood? I mean, obviously, you mentioned with your vice presidential debate coming up, that's going to be something huge for you. Um, in the near future, but what, what are you guys saying about in terms of live video at, at Longwood? Um, so some of the things we've had a lot of success with in, as far as live streaming, and when you were talking about the students at graduation in Snapchat, um, even those just short like, nine-second um, kind of live videos too, uh, those have been really successful. So we've been doing those at our regional events. So if we're at a, um, like at a baseball game or a cookout, those are fun too. But as far as live streaming, um, like you said, the debate. We're hoping to do season two of the Real World Chronicles, Sans, Stomach oh. Flu, and 90s Camera in the fall, um, which will be exciting, so I'll be sure to send that to all of you guys to see. Um, but our school is really tradition-based as well, so in the fall we have Oktoberfest, and I really would like to live stream. We have a thing called Color Wars, where in our big quad there's buckets of red paint and green paint, and based on if you're a freshman or a senior or a junior or sophomore, you're on different teams and you throw paint at each other and it's this huge epic paint battle um, and alums either come back or just go crazy over the photos every year. So I can definitely see that being a big hit. That's awesome. So those are things you can plan and, and this leads me to I think our, our last topic. Um, and Dom, you drew my attention to it. University of Chicago was brilliant uh, after Prince died. Tell us a little bit about how they tapped into Facebook Live to really capture, I mean, the views on that video are un unbelievable, but believable given that that was such a, you know, just earth-shattering event for so many people. So t talk about how we can use that, this technology to respond to these, you know, in real-time events. 
Yeah, I just thought it was really cool. And just besides the, ob the obvious, you know, um, as far as timing, I, I think it must have been the same day or, or the day after. Um, visually, it was really cool because it was kind of this intimate uh, camera angle. Um, but even besides those things, I thought that it was interesting that it was still valuable to people who were tuning in. Let's even say what they, they did for I, I, That was my bad. I teed you up to say what they did, and then we didn't actually ever say what, what it was. It was a video of... Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, like, um, what are you talking about? Uh, so yeah. start with that and then say what was good about it. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Um, so um, you Chicago, so they, I guess they have some kind of bell tower, um, and so they have um, a student who, I guess, every day would come in and play some some kind of song on the bell tower, and everybody on campus can hear it, I guess, just like a lot of campuses. Um, and so what they did was either the day that, that Prince uh, passed away or, you know, the day after, they had a student go up there and play uh, two of his songs, and I'm sorry, not, uh, they're not coming to mind for me, I think. Um, yeah. Um, tweet the link out. Ashley, Ashley has been killing it on the tweets on at Higher Ed Live. So anything that we've mentioned, it's out there today. So if you just check out the hashtag or check out at Higher Ed Live, the Twitter handle, like almost everything we've referenced today is out there. So thank you to Ashley, who's behind the scenes. I'll bet but, the farm on Purple Rain is one of the songs. I'm yeah, just I was going to say it was, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it was yeah. just a way that they really, they knew that they could you know, enter the conversation. We saw a lot of brands enter the conversation in a really, really bad way. We could do a whole episode about that. Yeah. Um, but, so, you know, I think it was a really thoughtful way to to remember Prince and to show something that they could offer. And obviously their, um, their Facebook fans really, you know, ate it up and, and bought into it and loved it and commented and shared their memories. And I just thought it was really neat. Mm -hmm. So anywho, anyone else have anything that I, I haven't, touched on in our last 47 minutes uh, of this episode. This is just one of my favorite topics. I love what we can do, you know, with that simple little iPhone um, sharing these videos, and it's just, it's great. So anything anything that I missed, Paige or Keith or Dom? I'll just uh, add the, the bell tower made me realize that I didn't, I didn't mention something we've been doing for the last uh, year and a half now is offering some live video opportunities for more segmented audiences. Uh, for example, we've done a, a few live events specifically uh, for a virtual audience, and these are all members of a certain giving society at Cornell. So the only way you get access to, to this live event is to be part of this giving society, which requires you to be a, a consecutive donor year, uh, year to year. Uh, the first one we did was a uh, concert, a chimes concert in our in our clock tower, uh, just for this virtual audience. So they were able to kind of submit requests and vote on which songs would be played ahead of time. And then the the chimes masters, you know, we were right up against the chimes masters with the camera, and that gave them a really a really kind of first person perspective. Uh, because I think that's one of the challenges with live videos. How do you make it matter more to the virtual audience? Mm -hmm. So in, in, instead of just doing a, a live stream of a giant event that so many people are at, doing events that are only for a virtual audience, uh, I have seen are usually some of the more engaging ones. Mm -hmm. um, I also failed to mention with regards to the uh, the Giving Day video, uh, kind of the, the, the live video on Giving Day, the some statistics with regards to our reach. Uh, we had nearly 18,000 video views across the 24 hours of the live video. And we hit, uh, looks like, uh, over 100 countries. And we had guests from about 10 different countries <laughs> uh, throughout the show because we were going back and forth between in-studio and remote interviews. Uh, so you can get a lot of reach. I think that's what sometimes people forget is, you know, a lot of the, uh, our universities are, are international uh, alumni populations, uh, global universities that have a, a far reach, and video is really the only way to connect those alumni back. It's, it's easy to forget about international alumni, but if you're at a large university, you probably have a decent yeah. alumni population, and you can send emails, you can send postcards, I guess. I, I wouldn't. 
but I'll do it. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, the fact that you can interview someone or, or give someone a live viewing experience when you're in upstate New York and they're in Hong Kong is, is pretty neat. It's pretty awesome. It is. Anything uh, to add, Paige or Dom? Or shall um, we have a, have yeah, a just day? Like, yeah, just like really, really quick. I think uh, somebody at some point mentioned um, demographics on Periscope and kind of because it's like this new tool, um, I guess it's easy to, easy to assume that um, our students are using it. But we've taught, we haven't met a student yet on campus who told us that they knew what Periscope was. Um, so <laughs> I don't know if that's been the same, um, if you guys have experienced the same at your universities, but... It's one of those early 90s antiques. <laughs> hey, 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 good one. Yeah. No, I, I think you're right. I, I don't think there's too many students who really actively use Twitter on our campus either, so why would they be on Periscope? That's a really good point, Dom. Um, uh, this means I have to start to understand Snapchat, which is just like a perfect cartoon in The New Yorker today, and it was like just, you're speaking my language, New Yorker. I just do not understand that platform. And Paige is like, all right, Grandma, thanks for broadcasting. I appreciate it. <laughs> that's, that's totally your jam. Um, anyway, Paige, Paige, are you, you good? Anything to add to final parting words? We're definitely looking forward to, and we haven't done anything with Facebook Live yet, but I think, Dom, it was something you sent around earlier, but maybe doing like a, a night before move-in with admissions and partnering with some of like the student mentors and the admissions counselors. Those are kind of the things we're hoping to do is partner with other offices on campus because, I mean, it sounds like you guys have a really inclusive um, kind of live streaming, and right now it's just me. So. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Well, I don't know how that 51 minutes flew by as quickly as it did, but that was awesome. Thank you all, Dom and Keith and Paige, so much. Um, Keith, you especially for, for being on live video again after doing it for 24 hours. Uh, we appreciate it. And I learned something from every episode that we do, every episode that I watch, that Andrew broadcasts. Um, and it's just great. So thank you. Um, and Duke, except Duke, Dom, except for that one shot at Duke. <laughs> I was nice. Keith, thank you again. Paige, Welcome. more stomach flu for you at Longwood. And um, to everyone, thank you so much for watching this broadcast. And again, a special thank you to our sponsors. We had iModules and M Stoner sponsoring today's episode. Thank you all so much. And, uh, and we'll see you on the next show. Bye now. <laughs>